Uh, hey! What? Good afternoon! Thank you. And we should clap. This is my first time for a live event in, in the tech field since, since, well, the before times. Uh, fantastic. And what a fantastic venue and opportunity to be here for the VMUG Netherlands. Uh, it's, it's always been a big event. Uh, it's, a, it's a good crowd here. I spent a lot of time in the, in the Netherlands over the years, and I'm very, very excited to be here at this show because the topic of today's show, the theme, is about AI, right? And I thought, huh, well, when I think about AI, I feel like a lot of people are doing really cool stuff with it, but those are other people. Those aren't me. I feel like the AI train has left the station, and I missed it. And all I hear is how important it is and the skills we need and how it's changing everything and you got to work at it. And I'm like, I am so fucked because I missed the AI train. So my name is Brian Madden, and I... Uh, Again, I'm so happy to be here, and thank you to the organizers for, having the, for inviting me here. Uh, I actually work for, nowadays, I work for a consulting company called Ilki. Uh, Ilki is a Paris-based company. I, I live in Paris. Uh, of course, I'm still wearing my old VMware uniform, as you can see. Um, but uh, I do live in Paris now, so you can see if it doesn't look like I'm French now. Ah, there we go. <laughs> ah, so, d'accord. Je suis dans l'informatique uh, technology depuis 20 ans. Sorry, it, that happens when you put the scarf on. Uh, but I've been in IT for, for 30 years. 30 years, May 1994, is when I took money to touch someone else's computer for the first time. Uh, Lantastic, by the way. <laughs> uh, so I've been in IT for 30 years. I've had just an insanely rewarding career. And I'm here today to stand on stage and tell you that I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm Wide open in the bright lights, haven't had a clue. And I feel like I have had a clue in the past, right? I look back at my career, uh, I did BrianMedden.com for 15 years. I wrote or edit edited or published eight different books about VDI and Citrix and DAS and enterprise mobility. I created a conference called Bri Forum. I worked at VMware. I worked for Sean Bass in the EUC office of the CTO. I, I worked with this really tall, bearded, orange beard guy and drew on the glass. We had to learn how to write backwards. It was fantastic. I did a lot of things there. I, I actually wrote, I left VMware a couple years ago and I wrote that I was leaving to work at a pinball company, uh, like the actual ball you move around with the flippers. Uh, and we built software, we built hardware for other people's pinball machines. Uh, Labyrinth is a machine that runs on our platform. I did all the documentation for them and diagrams and technical explainers, just like I was doing in tech. And then a couple months ago, I wrote that I'm moving to Paris and I'm joining a consulting company called Ilki. Ilki, by the way, is a consulting and analyst company. We are not a vendor partner. We do not partner with any vendors, completely independent. So after having gone back and forth to working at vendors over the years, I'm, I'm now completely independent, which means I can say whatever I want. As you know, that never stopped me in the past. <laughs> but I had a very rewarding 30 years. I've done a lot of sort of great things. But now I'm here. I'm like, what am I doing? Like, that's in the past. Man, I, what am I doing today? I'm an EUC guy, right? I spent a couple years 
after VMware working on this pinball thing, kind of my like, uh, just refresh, recharge, uh, do something that was not about, you know, HIPAA compliance and, uh, you know, GDPR compliance and all this kind of stuff. But now I'm back in Ilkey and I'm doing consulting and working in digital workspace and things like that. And I'm like, okay, let me see uh, what's been happening in the EUC space. So there's that company, Citrix, I did a lot of stuff about and they um, are, that's weird looking now. <laughs> uh, it's different and wow, they're actually owned by a private equity company. Weird. Uh, well, VMware, of course, uh, you know, obviously did a lot with VMware and oh, they're owned by this company that treats them like private equity and VMware EUC is literally becoming a private equity company. I'm like, these are my favorites. My whole world was Citrix, VMware, Microsoft. What's happening to Citrix? What's happening to VMware? What's happening to Microsoft? How is Microsoft doing? Uh, huh. Uh, not bad. <laughs> it's $3 billion market cap. So I'm told that's $3 trillion market cap. <laughs> uh, the funny stat I saw the other day is not only is Microsoft higher market cap than Apple, but they're higher, they're one full Tesla market cap higher than Apple. And I'm like, what, what is happening? Uh, VMware is now owned by private equity and customers are getting nervous. Citrix is now owned by private equity and customers are getting nervous. Microsoft is crushing it and everyone loves them and is also the most valuable company in the known universe. Like, how long was I asleep? <laughs> My God, that was a hell of a game of pinball <laughs> I played. But what is happening in our world? This is not the world I recognize anymore. And I think about this and I think about how things turn over. There's a book that's pretty popular in the US and I think it applies to all the Western world called The Fourth Turning Is Here. Uh, you can read the book, it's okay. Listen to a podcast with the guy, you get the whole gist in 30 minutes. But, uh, but the, the gist though is that, you know, the generations, right? Like baby boomers and Gen Z and Gen X and everything are, you know, 20 to 25 year generations. But every four generations is 80 to 100 years, which is the macro cycle. And it sort of follows the seasons. And I've been thinking about that. Uh, we're in winter, by the way, <laughs> in case you're wondering. Um, so... But I've been thinking about the seasons, the seasons of life and the seasons of a company. And I think that's a great analogy. Like if I think about VMware, VMware was, you know, they started in the spring. In the spring, things are new. The little shoots are coming up. It's a blank landscape. Um, and VMware springtime was sort of, you know, workstation and like GSX and ESX is still kind of finding their footing. Remember we heard about the first time you ever heard about VMware? And you're like, I'm sorry, it sounds like what you're saying is crazy. <laughs> and then we're like, it's good for labs. There's no way I would ever put a production workload on that. Uh, and, you know, after the spring comes the summertime and summer for VMware is like, that's when things, the sun is shining. We're being bold. We're being strong. It's our, it's our fun times. It's vSphere. It's vSAN, Horizon, Workspace One. And then after summer comes the fall, comes the autumn. And autumn for VMware was when you start collecting resources and bulking up, right? And that's VeloCloud and Carbon Black and Pivotal and Nyansa and lots of other ones we could mention. Because you need to have enough in the store for the winter. And the winter, you're owned by PE. You have to reevaluate everything, right? You fire some customers, you fire its employees, you make room for what's next. It's true. This is not a bad thing, by the way. We need the cycle. We're all making room for what's next. And this is, I can say this about Citrix too, right? Uh, equally as big part of my career as VMware. You know, we had WinFrame, MetaFrame, Enfuse in the springtime. It was all new. We couldn't believe what it was. You know, Zen Apps and Desktop Access Gateway was the summer when things are really bulking up and becoming very popular. Citrix bought ZenSource, Cloud.com, ShareFile, uh, Podio, ZenPrize, Rike, all these other things to bulk up for the winter. And um, 
while their winter now is owned by PE, reevaluate everything, fire some customers, fire some employees, and make room for what's next. Again, this is not bad. This is the cycle because at the end of the winter comes spring and you need to have room for what's next or else it can't flourish, right? The little green shoots only get sunlight because everything on top of them, the leaves have fallen off and it's been cleared out for the winter. And this also, by the way, does not apply just to companies, right? It can apply to me or you or each of us personally. I think about the seasons of my career. I began my career 30 years ago in Akron, Ohio, in the U.S., working for VARS, working for value-added resellers. And I was learning about things and figuring things out. You know, then I think when I left to do my own thing and did BrianMadden.com, that was my summer, BrianMadden.com, BriForum, the books, training, learning how to give presentations. Autumn for me was the VMware CTO office, working at VMware. Uh, that, that's where you really take everything that you work so hard all summer for and harvest. I had been uh, a commenter in the industry. I've been an industry analyst. I've been a consultant. I've been a speaker. Now it's time to do something. Let's build some products. Let's do it when it actually, uh, you know, the, the ideas need to be implemented and there's teams behind it, not just someone making comments from the peanut gallery, as my dad used to say. Uh, and then winter for me was fast pinball, which that's not a knock on pinball. Uh, winter for me was backing away from what I was doing in technology. You kind of hunker down in the winter, learn new technologies. I was working with GitHub. I learned about GitHub Auto, um, GitHub Copilot. Uh, you know, I was working on coding. I was doing things that weren't about. I was refreshing, uh, like healing, uh, all the things we do in winter. And so I had the cycle. And of course I needed the winter so that I could have the spring and start anew. And that applies also, by the way, not just to uh, our whole career. It can apply to individual pieces of our career or even individual technologies. You know, think about yourself and how the seasons work. The spring for all of us, whether it's our career or a company or whether we are looking at uh, a specific technology that we're interested in, spring is all about learning and exploration. Spring is experimentation. Right? It's new tools, it's new technologies, it's new concepts. Everything's fun and new and bright and nothing really matters because if four of the seeds die, there's four more over here and you're trying to figure it out. You're starting to build a foundation, understanding the principles of the technologies and the things that we're working with. And it's where we make our initial mistakes. We all have to be able to make mistakes and learn our lessons and figure out. That's what spring is for all of us. Summer then, when we're working with a technology, this is where we start really implementing the knowledge that we learned in the spring. This is where we start to grow and expand. This is where we start collaborating. You know, you go from like, remember the first time that you posted in a forum? The first time that you responded to an email? The first time you stood on stage? It felt pretty good. You might not do that in the spring because you're just kind of learning and this is here, this is here. And oops, I killed that one. Luckily, there's 15 other seedlings to work with. But summer, you start to, to share a little bit and it feels good. You're expanding, you're growing, you're meeting peers, you're going to VMUGs and shaking hands and seeing the same people you saw last year, last year, last year. The summer is when you start to gain the confidence and you gain the visibility. And it doesn't have to be visibility within the world. It doesn't even have to be visibility within the VMUG. It can be visibility within your company, within your friends, within your peer groups. Like, no, this guy actually knows some things. And then we get into autumn. And again, we think of autumn as like dying and everything's falling away, but that's the end of autumn. Autumn is really reaping the benefits. It's the harvest time. Now in autumn, you start leading major initiatives. You start leading major projects in this technology. You start mentoring people. You start really sharing the knowledge you built up in the summer. You, you really just refine all these things you've been learning. You optimize, you refine all the processes and the methods. And you start to get recognized as an expert. Again, doesn't have to be on the global stage doesn't have to be on the VMUG stage. It could be within your department, within your company, within your friends. Autumn is the real time to sort of start to really benefit from all the work you've been doing. And then that leads us into winter. Winter is about reflection, right? This is where we, we reflect on our achievements. We reflect on what's phasing out. What have we been doing those past few seasons that is not relevant as much anymore? We're planning for the future. What am I going to do next year? There's a reason the new year starts 
our calendar in the winter. I plan for what's next year. I, I plan for, for what's changed. I, I start to let go of things that are outdated, the outdated technologies, the outdated practices, and I make space for growth and innovation. And then, of course, that leads us into spring. <laughs> Look at the slide here, by the way. Like, this is what happens if you let uh, Microsoft Copilot design your slides. <laughs> I'm kidding, I did this myself, but I'm only seeing it now for the first time. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a cycle, you know? And if I take a technology, I'll take Citrix, and I can say, you know, the, the, the Citrix technology, for me, it might go through its spring phase, its summer phase, its autumn phase, and its winter phase. That might not be the same phase as it with the company, right? This is your phase, is what it means to you. And it's also happening with multiple technologies. It's Citrix, it's VMware, maybe it's cloud, maybe it's cubes. I, the, don't read into the words and the, the, the cycles here. I'm just saying all of us has a lot of different technologies in different seasons. While we're learning on one, it's summer and the other, we're harvesting another one, this one's dead, I'm making space. So it just continues again and again and again. And this happens with all of us in all of our careers. I can look at my career myself. 30 years I've been working now. So from 1994 to 2024, I began on the help desk. I was a PC tech, Novell Netware was a thing for me, desktop engineering, SMS, you know, SCCM, Citrix, ASPs, Blades, VMware, VDI, HCI, MDM, MAM, EMM, the consumerization of IT, digital workspace, and the future of work. You know, 30 years, you can cram a lot in there. But really, every one of these things, I was like way into. <laughs> like, a lot, a lot. I read the books, I went to the conferences, I was in the, the, the um, newsrooms and the email list. I was way into every single one of these. I'm not into all these anymore. Some of them have longer cycles, some have shorter cycles, some have sub-cycles within them. Uh, they're all different, but I can look at this thing and say, okay, this is, this is the things that I've done, and they've had all these cycles of seasons. Remember, though, for me, I'm like trying to figure out what's next. Because, you know, it took a few years that my winter was my pinball time. And again, there's nothing, winter is important. There's nothing wrong with winter. That was my pinball time to figure out, and now I'm back into the sort of enterprise tech world after a couple of years in, in winter. And, and, and what is it? What is next? Well, I look at, I look at this... I'm like, where is this going? And what could it possibly be? What is next? <laughs> I think I got it. I've been doing some reading. I understand this is gonna be a thing. Okay, I feel good. I feel great. I feel wonderful that I know what's next. I know what the future is. I know where I have to focus my efforts. I know what has to happen. And here we are. Oh. Wonderful. And it's good. It's, it's fantastic because I know AI. I mean, hell, I've been doing AI since, ninth, uh, well, I mean, uh, actually 2023. Uh, yeah, I've been doing AI since 2023. Uh, it's funny, because you hear all these people, they're like, oh, now the AI is popular. I've been doing AI for 10 years, for 20 years, 30 years. And I'm like, I've been doing AI for 10 minutes. Uh, if you look at my life from, you know, 1977 to 2024, the percentage of my life of pre and post AI is about here, give or take. I'm, don't get me wrong. Uh, I know what AI was before, okay? Thank you very much. For sure, I understood AI in the world before. Like, I was a human who saw things, right? Like, I watched 2001. I watched Terminator. I watched her. You're all laughing. What? Computers that are too confusing for humans to understand. Killer robots, sex bots. Tell me what else I need to know about AI. Of course, 
over time, uh, you know, we got the co-pilots. We started figuring out ChatGPT was released. And ChatGPT, huh? Okay. It came out in 2022. I didn't use it for the first few months. But by the time in 2023 I started playing with ChatGPT, I was like, ah, I get this. This is clearly the future. I'm here. So as you can see, I know some things about the AI. The problem, of course, is uh, my modern present day AI is like this tiny little sliver. And I'm with all these people who've been doing AI for 10 years, for 20 years. They're making models and they're tuning and training and rag something or other and merging and they've got GitHub accounts and doing all these things. And I'm like, yeah, I'm good at the chat GPT. I mean, I can use it. Uh, so it's scary to me. And I feel like I don't know what to do, but I think it's okay, right? Because it's springtime for AI, not just for me, but it's springtime for AI. The technology cycle, the macro cycle for AI in the enterprise context is spring. Of course, even though it's spring and spring is the time that we are all learning and figuring things out, I feel like I'm already behind. Again, case in point, Johan's session today. <laughs> but I'm like, it's okay. I've done this before. I've learned, you saw the list. I learned like 20 new things, 30 new things in my career. So I know what to do. I uh, will just run that same playbook that I've done for the past 30 years when I learn new technologies. So off to the interwebs where I get my glasses out because that's how I roll now. Artificial intelligence, thank you. And there are 1.4 million, billion, trillion, does it matter? <laughs> uh, results, that's generic artificial intelligence. Let me do artificial intelligence learning and there are somehow even more. <laughs> I think what happened is the AI content exponentially increased in between the span of my two searches. There's literally 200 million more resources in the 30 seconds it took me to get my thoughts collected. It's fine though, like Google, everything's tough now, SEO, yada, yada, I'll just buy a book. I wrote books, y'all wrote books, that's how we learn things. You have to be smart to write a book, I go to Amazon, type in artificial intelligence, and there are 50,000 books for artificial intelligence. All right. Uh, I'll take one. <laughs> so it's, it's tough. Because, like, how do you jump on? This is what I'm saying. I feel like the train left, and I'm just standing on the platform, kind of holding my bag. So, okay. If I can just, like, take a breath and collect myself a little bit. I feel like, what do we know? Like, let's break this down. Like, what do we actually know about what to do next and how to address those technologies? Well, we know how to learn. We've done this before. We've all learned, like we're VMware experts, or cloud experts, the Microsoft experts. We've learned, we started from nothing and we learned. So, okay, we know how to learn. I can look back on my journey and know there's all sorts of technologies I was really into and I figured out. Um, we have to set a goal. Like everything, right? I spent a lot of years as a consultant. You set a goal and you work backwards from there. So my goal is like, I'm, I'm gonna be an AI, an AI expert, right? Because that, that's what's that's next. So, um, huh, here's what I start coming across. Uh, yeah, I'll give you a minute. Huh. Yeah, one of these quotes is mine. <laughs> uh, yeah, so like, kind of a panic attack again. <laughs> like, what in the world do I do with this? How do I even understand what's happening here? You know, because for me, <laughs> I'm even doing this, as I said, I live in Paris now. I say I'm currently learning about artificial intelligence. It's funny, um, as I'm worried about the train leaving without me, you know how you say I'm currently learning about artificial intelligence in French? <laughs> you say, um, je suis en train de prendre l'intelligence artificielle. Like, literally it tells you that you need to be on the train. Which we have already established, I am not. <laughs> it's a little bit more of a panic attack. What am I doing? I say, well, okay, what do we know? 
What do we know? Go back, go back to what we know. So you can't become an AI expert, right? That's not a thing, as we sort of just looked at. And it's, it's sort of because it's, it's too big, there's too much. This is different than our old journeys. But hey, it's spring, right? It's, it's spring for AI. The stakes are low. So now it's the time to play. Springtime is about learning, exploration, experimentation, new tools, new technologies, build the foundation, start to understand the principles. We can make mistakes. We'll learn things. Uh, it's okay to mess up at this point. And which is kind of nice, because honestly, as I play more with AI, which I've been doing for like a year now, thank you very much, uh, what you focus on actually doesn't matter. And this is a good thing. For example, do you remember how prompt engineering was going to be all the rage? You had to learn how to be a prompt engineer. Uh, there were job postings for prompt engineers. Prompt engineering went from the hottest new tech job to made obsolete by AI in six months, right? The AI auto fixes its prompts based on what you type. It figures out what you might want. And you don't have to be a prompt engineer anymore. Uh, there's a countless stories of this. There's a story of a company that spent $10 million training chat GPT on their own data. Only to find when GPT-4 was released, <laughs> it outperformed it across the board, straight out of the box. Oops. <laughs> I mean, that's an expensive lesson. But the point is, it's not like you're behind. What model? What do I do? What do I need to understand here? It's changing so fast. That's the thing. That's what we really know right now. It's changing so fast. So for us, we just have to take a step back. Like, what's our goal? You know, is our goal to, to figure out how our company can use AI? You know, think about where things are going and how that will affect the company. Is the goal to figure out how we can use AI to improve ourselves and what we're doing on our own? Or is our goal to upskill ourselves for future employability? If these white collar jobs are at risk, that's what I do. <laughs> I think a lot of my things, my personal goal is like, what's work going to look like in five years or 10 years? And how do I make sure that I can provide value in a way that fits in? So any one of these goals is fine. They're not even necessarily mutually exclusive. But I think what is important is that we do figure out what our goal is uh, before we start to start to play with the different things. And then, Regardless of the goal, we have to keep in mind, we're not going to become experts. This is not how it was with VMware, with Citrix, with Microsoft. In those days, we could actually get the book about VMware. We could get the book about Horizon. We could read all the instruction manuals. We could do a couple big projects. And you could be like legitimately an expert on Horizon. After you know, a few years of work, a few decades, you know all the underlying technologies. That's not a thing that exists in AI. So the first thing we have to do is really change our mindset. But it's okay because we don't have to know how something works in order to know that it's valuable. Uh, airplanes, I don't know how they work. I guess apparently <laughs> mechanics don't either. Uh, that's some of the stories going around. Talk to, talk to, why is Chris late? Uh, so uh, we don't have to know how it works to know it's valuable, right? Um, we don't have to know how something works to know how to use it, right? I'm good at a lot of things that I can do that I don't actually know how they work. That's different though than us from what we've been doing in the past. It's different than the way other technologies have, have uh, worked. Um, there's that quote, or the easiest way to predict the future, you know the end of this quote, is to invent it. That's malarkey. <laughs> the way, inventing the future is very, very difficult. Uh, luckily though, for me, I think the easiest way to invent the, the predict the future is to think about what assumptions will be true. We know about uh, models will get better and better. We know about technology. We know how capitalism works. We know how the different uh, systems will kind of fit together. We know how human nature works. We know how companies work. So we can think about those and then think about what assumptions we have today that we know for sure are true. And then we can apply those uh, to the future and then work backwards from there. So, you know, the thing is today, of course, the hype around AI is following the same playbook that the hype around any technology follows. You know, I spent a lot of time at BrianBen.com and the books that I was doing, uh, kind of like de-hypifying what vendors are doing in the space. And in fact, that's what's happening. We're fully maximumed uh, in the AI world right now. Vendor shenanigans are maxed out. 
when it comes to AI. And again, this helps play into the feeling that we're all being left behind. Because we see all the things Microsoft is doing. We see all the things that the vendors are doing. We see all the things that the companies are doing. And, you know, we're, everything's on Hugging Face. And you go to Hugging Face and you're like, what is this even? Uh, and you, everything's faster, faster, next, 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 next. But I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's hype. AI is real, of course. The technology is real. But the hype around AI is 100x of what the reality is. So we're not as far behind as we thought we were because a lot of things that we're seeing are sort of nonsense. And that's good because we've been dealing with vendor nonsense our whole careers. In fact, um, we have Maximus Awesomeness uh, from Vendor Slides right now. You know, the, you, you see vendors talk and they talk about these things. You're like, that is amazing and exactly what I want. And you start to think about it and you're like, well, actually, uh, yeah, this is actually nonsense. Uh, I'll show you, like, uh, these are slides from, like, real sh AI shows I've been to. I blacked out the vendor logos. Um, you know, but by the way, these two slides, this is true. Uh, two different conferences. The slide that had the most, like, arms up taking photos. Um, and I took a photo just because I was like, wow, look at all these people taking pictures of these slides. And later on, I'm like, what does this actually say? Like, it's nothing. <laughs> this... Real world data is power. Don't trust. The tech is mind blowing, but not limitless. It'll create value, not everywhere. Costs can rapidly skyrocket if you don't pay attention. This is all true. But that applies to like, I don't know, the cloud and your Microsoft licensing and like literally everything else in, in the business world that we've been applying. And the number of arms up taking pictures, it was nonsense. Um, I've started writing about this more on LinkedIn, by the way. Uh, so that's where I'm like, I guess, blogging now, for lack of a better word, uh, is just on, on LinkedIn. Um, but I've been going to these conferences, and, and you know, what you read coming out of there, you, you think that you're so far behind, but then it turns out as we start to process a little bit more, we're not as behind as we thought, because it's springtime for all these vendors also. You know, they don't know what they're doing. I mean, in a good way, right? Like, it's, they're experimenting. They're figuring out. They're seeing what happens, what sticks, what can we do? What can we, like, how do we make a message? How do we engage with the people? What, what, what's actually real? And everyone is figuring this out at the same time. And there's lots of individual wins. We have this in spring when these shoots come up. But that largely speaking, there's a lot of nonsense out there. Uh, it's funny because even now, there's, in the past few weeks, uh, we've started to see more articles about like people dialing back the expectations about what their things can do, even on things like all the various co-pilot things. When you sign up initially, um, they're starting to say, well, you know, don't care about this use case and careful about this use case. And remember, it's an LLM, it's just statistics and it might not be the same. And um, so that we're starting to see like rollbacks of uh, the expectations. It's that whole vendor cycle, the vendor hype cycle, where you hit the trough of in the peak of inflated expectations and then you get to the trough of, del of delusionment. And that's kind of where we are. Virtualization had this, the cloud had this, uh, Citrix had this, VDI had this. Every one of these technologies on that 30-year cycle had this. This is not bad. This is not saying that, that AI is not good for things. This is saying that where we are right now, we have time. We are not as behind as we thought we might have been uh, just because we haven't like, built a model yet on our own laptops. So again, it keeps on going back to what we know. <laughs> and this is really funny because what we know is uh, this is the first time in history that no one has any idea what the world will look like in 20 years. Uh, Yuval Noah Harari wrote that. He's the one that did Sapiens and um, th these books. Uh, and he, he actually, he said that on uh, Colbert a, a few uh, weeks ago. Um, like, as, human as humanity, forget IT and virtualization and cloud and this kind of thing. We don't know what the world is going to look like in the next 20 years. We don't have any understanding for like, does capitalism exist? Does business exist? Are we all on universal basic income? Do, like, does it affect countries? Uh, there's a lot of moving pieces that are going into this. So we don't know, which is, again, for us, allows us to sort of take a step back and catch our breaths and say, it's okay if we don't fully understand where things are going. Um, for me, this is an opportunity for us. Uh, things are definitely different this time. We know that AI is, again, it's a, it's a bigger change than virtualization or the cloud or a specific technology. We understand it affects everything, not just within the tech world, but in all of our society.
So this is not as easy. It's not like it was in the old days where I, I read about a new technology, you buy a book, you attend a conference, you sort of know everything you need to know now and now you can go out and do it. That's not what it is. It is still the wild, like super wacky creation, figuring things out. And also things are changing faster than we can learn them. No matter what you figure out, no matter what model, no matter what you download, even model, remember it was a big deal to figure out what model you need. Well, this model does this, this model does that. Um, by the way, I didn't mention this when I was talk talking about vendors, but um, I read an article about how the vendor, you know, there's all these benchmarks for the models. Benchmarks are benchmarks. It's just like in the virtualization world where the vendors who are making the models can kind of tune the models to pass the benchmarks and the benchmarks don't necessarily represent real world use anyway. Uh, so just like we have with sizing VDI servers, sizing storage, sizing our VMware servers, um, it's all the same thing. So things are changing so fast. We can now merge models together uh, and you create new models. It's, it's very dynamic and very interesting, um, but it's, it's a big change. So the vendors, the solutions, the techniques, even the limitations of what we have today is not going to be the same in six months. But again, that's okay. It's still spring. It's still an AI spring. Now's our chance for not knowing what we're doing. Now's our chance for the, for the vendors not to know. We give the vendors a pass. They give us a pass. We give each other a pass. We are figuring out what's happening as we're going along. You know, there's this old adage, like you heard this, like no one ever got fired for buying IBM. Like just do the one thing that everyone did before you. We said about VMware, no one ever got fired about, for buying VMware. Um, uh, did everyone, did anyone, ever get fired for doing nothing. It's like a weird time when companies are building their AI strategy around actually waiting to see how things shake out. Not everyone's doing that, and that's, that's valid for some and valid for others, but there is a time, like the fear, we have to jump in, we have to establish something, we have to make big moves right now. Um, we can wait a little bit. So to me, it's funny because if you look back at this, the consumerization of IT, Right? Shadow IT. I spent a lot of work doing this. This is one of my things I did in my career, uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago, where uh, the users could sort of do whatever they wanted. Well, <laughs> what do we know right now? We know that AI is the ultimate consumerization of IT. Uh, because, because AI is the ultimate consumerization of, of IT, every company out there is an early adopter. Uh, for AI. Even if they're not doing it at the company level, uh, their employees are doing it. So a lot of companies are very leading edge and experimenting and competing with um, getting AI advantage without their knowledge at all. Uh, there's a great article that I uh, just read, and I'll, I'll give the resources at the end, about detecting the secret cyborgs. Because in some ways, that's what AI is, right? You're like you're a human machine augmented, uh, especially if you're a knowledge worker, knowledge and intelligence-based uh, that's what you exchange for money, the machines are helping you. You know, LLMs kind of make terrible software today. Uh, it's it's, it's um, statistical rather than like um, procedural, and things are sometimes weird. Uh, we're working on that. They're working on that. I'm not working on it at all. Uh, but um, they're awesome for individual productivity. And every study, everyone yourself, if you use a GPT, I pay for three different GPT services now, 20 bucks a month each that I'm using, uh, like, I couldn't even guess how many times a day, 50 times a day, all of them. Uh, and they help in all these little ways. We understand how hallucination works. You understand what you can ask, what you have to check, where you can trust it, where you don't trust it. It's just like our relationship with the coworker. So we know that uh, the LLMs can be great for our own productivity. And we also know that if we ignore this, like are our coworkers ignoring this? Uh, are our competitors ignoring this? Uh, so for us, it's, uh, it's the ultimate uh, reflection of IT not really being in control of what their users are able to do. And the company is not really able to be in control. So as a company, uh, we're trying to understand that, uh, but we're still trying to understand and figure out and play with things. Um, a lot of this kind of stuff I got, by the way, um, there's, a, there's a website I love for, for AI sort of thought leadership called synthetic.work. I don't know if you know this website. If you don't know the website, you know the guy, Alessandro Pirelli, who did virtualization.info, right? That dude has been doing AI for like 20 years now uh, at Red Hat before this. Um, and his website, as far as resources, is fantastic. 
his newsletters are once a week. They're like 20 pages. I, my mind is blown every single one that I read. Um, I have a few other resources that I like uh, also. Um, so Alessandro Pirelli uh, for synthetic.work. Um, I really love Daniel Meisler, uh, danielmeisler.com. Uh, and I love uh, Ethan Mollick uh, at oneusefulthing.org. Um, and of course, uh, <laughs> I love talking to my actual real humans uh, in things like these VMUGs. Um, so this for me is as we're taking our first steps, it's like the baby deer who's just starting to stumble and walk. As we're taking our first steps, we start to understand uh, what things can do, where to look. Uh, we need guidance. And these are some of the resources, including everyone here in this room that I've been looking at. So um, I wanna make one program note before I uh, leave you uh, with my final thoughts. Um, and that is I'm coming to the Netherlands uh, like right before uh, King's Day. <laughs> uh, so I'm still doing a lot of uh, EUC work. I've, I've, there's a two-day training class that I'm teaching um, on digital workplace. It's my 30 years of EUC knowledge crammed down into two days. Uh, and I'll be doing it in Utrecht uh, next month. So that's a thing um, that I want to mention. Uh, but the final thing I want to leave you all with is we have to just start playing. And, and again, not be afraid, it's springtime, let's, let's do it. For me, so what am I playing with? My next fun is this thing called Open Interpreter. Have you heard of Open Interpreter? This project began last year, because like all of them. So Open Interpreter, uh, you go to openinterpreter.com, uh, this is their website, a new way to use computers. Open Interpreter lets LLMs run code on your computer to complete tasks. It's an LLM interface to your desktop, and it can see your screen, it can interact with it. Completely open source and free. In fact, uh, they have this thing called the O1 computer, which you build on an ESP32. Uh, they have the code, the hardware, like the HDL files, they have everything where you can talk to it. And you're saying, like, open this email, go to this task, open this, look at this email. It's actually watching and screen scraping your desktop, uh, but it can do things on its own. It's a full interface. You can run your own LLM on it. Um, you can... Um, you know, like use OpenAI or use other ones that sort of exist. But what's interesting is like, it runs on your desktop though. So you can go out in the world and actually talk on this little device or there's an there's a iPhone app also, but your desktop has to run in the background, right? So you have to like have your desktop on, have your computer running and everything. But the desktop is like the ultimate aggregation point. And the aggregation point of all my applications, my files, all those things. So I have to keep a desktop running in the cloud which I can then access from anywhere. Huh. Keep a desktop running in the cloud that I can access from anywhere. In other words, could it be? Is it finally true? Did we get there? Is that what it took? that AI finally means this can be the year of the desktop? Wow, we made it. There's a purpose. It's the cloud. It's fantastic. I'm so excited about it. I'm gonna be playing with this next week. I hope you all play with it too. And I really, really, really thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Thank you.